We're the uh, world leader in meat alternatives, so plant-based plant -based alternatives uh, to meat, uh, particularly replicating the taste and texture you get when you eat a meat-type product. Uh, we've been doing that for over 30 years and selling over 20 countries. Uh, so it's not a new phenomenon for us, but certainly in the last five to 10 years, we've seen an acceleration in the trend towards those products and been investing heavily to uh, take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and we see that uh, trend continuing. It's almost generational in that younger, more educated consumers generally uh, believe they should eat less meat than their parents' diet typically has. The motivation is currently a small pop group of the population. It's ethics. That's kind of always been there, vegetarians and vegans. There's a modest trend in growth in, all, in that, more towards more vegans within that pool than the big growth. Uh, the major driver currently is health. That's the number one reason why people are cutting down on meat consumption. It's very well publicised that particularly red and processed meats are materially, too much of them are materially bad for our health. Uh, and then there's a growing uh, concern around the environment and sustainability of meat production. Uh, but that's a, currently a very small factor set to become a, a bigger factor. The fairly obvious barriers for any new trend, which is the quality of the products are offered, uh, if the product's experience isn't good, it doesn't matter what the health benefits are, consumers are not going to repeat purchase. Uh, and we're seeing too much of that in certain markets where kind of low quality people have, have looked to make a quick buck by entering the category, not really developing great products. Uh, but secondly, kind of awareness. So a lot of the time consumers are not that aware relative to low levels of trial of the category. Uh, even in the UK where we've been for 30 years, there's still huge parts of the population haven't tried the category? Well, certainly what we do is, is three things. We, we invest continually in advertising, so we, we spend more and more every year for the biggest advertiser around the world in this category. We continue to innovate, we keep looking to produce great new products. We've launched a lot of vegan products uh, lately, for example. Uh, but we also renovate, so we actually take our core products and try to make them better and better. Because the higher that we can take them up uh, from a taste and food experience point of view, uh, the more we can bring in and keep people. I, th I think there's multiple benefits. Obviously we can learn, learn from each other. We're, I mean we're not going to dominate the entire category around the world in, a, in our space. Uh, we can learn from related categories like dairy where they're going through a similar trends. Uh, having access to the ingredients and process uh, side of the industry is really helpful because it's, it is and should be an innovative space. We're looking to do things differently, not do something we've done for the last 100 years over and over again. Uh, and we need ingredient suppliers to help with that. We need the kind of processing capability of some of the companies to help us. Having it all in one place is great. Buzzwords. I, I haven't got any buzzwords. I, we, do, we ban buzzwords in our company. I hire people from big multinationals and I have to take out. There was, I interviewed somebody and they came up with a, they started talking about meet, meeting cadence. I just didn't want to hire him. I'm going, I don't even know what you're talking about, but it's just complete crap. We don't have any meeting cadence, whatever that is. And the, the drumbeat of the company, I was like, oh, we haven't got that either. You know, it's like, it's terrible. Yeah. So we try to talk English as best we can. Well, the, the opportunities for the vegetarian category are huge. Uh, frankly speaking, there's such a wide range where we still can fill in gaps. Um, it starts with building awareness among consumers. Uh, one of the biggest barriers we see today among consumers that they truly don't know about the vegetarian section in, in stores. First, second, they even if they are aware, they very often don't know what to do with it, how to prepare a meal with vegetarian products. Um, so I believe that you know, in, in building this awareness about the richness of the vegetarian meal selection category, we can uh, truly recruit way more consumers, get them in their weekly repertoire. Uh, but for that, there's a lot of work to be done because we need to um, offer, first of all, tasty products. Uh, and unfortunately today, we still, there's a lot of, uh, I would call them gold diggers. That's a very negative approach. But it, uh, I, what I mean to say is there's a lot of companies that enter into the market without really bringing something that meets the needs of the consumer. So um, taste is important, nutritional balance is very important because there's a lot of 
companies that enter with uh, hugely salted or, or relatively fat products, that's not the way forward. So if we really want to recruit new consumers and retain them in the category, we have to deliver on taste, on texture, on appearance, uh, and we need to bring inspiration and excitement, uh, and, and a vegetable excitement, uh, which, uh, which we try to do with our Garden Gourmet brand. Uh, having such a wide portfolio of uh, products ranging from ingredients you can cook with to center of the plate to truly uh, veggie creations and the mats and the hummus. So basically we offer uh, a whole range from truly cooking to ready to eat or ready to heat products, uh, allowing for different usage occasions. So this being said, I think the biggest opportunity is to, uh, to drive recruitment, to attract new consumers to the category. Uh, but there are some rules to do that. You cannot just put products on the shelf and believe it's going to happen. Yeah. It's a kind of a revolution what we're uh, aiming for because um, when you look at the, the, the protein consumption, which is a bit of a technical word, but when you look at the protein consumption uh, today, um, uh, there is a disbalance between animal proteins and, and plant-based proteins. First of all, we consume too many proteins. We only need 50 grams of proteins uh, on a daily basis. And in many regions, uh, Europe, uh, the US, um, we consume close to 80, 90 grams. So we almost eat double the, the, the amount of proteins that is truly uh, uh, needed. Um, and there's a disbalance between uh, uh, plant-based and animal-based uh, um, proteins. Whereas when you look to Asia, in, there's whole regions in Africa where the plant-based protein consumption is much bigger and, and, and therefore more sustainable and healthier. So um, what we uh, aim to do with the proposition that we have as Garden Gourmet with a very rich and an inspiring uh, portfolio is to make it easy for people to switch, to enter into a category and to discover it not as uh, strictly a meat replacement category but as a a new food style proposition which is delicious, which is nutritious and which can be a, a perfect uh, element of your uh, meal solution. There's actually a lot of commonalities. We've done UNAs in, uh, in many European markets, so usage and attitude uh, researches. And um, although you see difference between markets, uh, there's basically three main drives that you will find everywhere, which is um, uh, health, which is environmental or, or um, uh, sustainab sustainability uh, related uh, drivers and there is um, uh, animal welfare, so ethics. Um, and it, it, then again, you know, for example in the UK health is maybe a bit bigger than, than, than the sustainability one, uh, but uh, in all cases you will see these, this animal welfare, sustainability and health uh, coming in a top, top three box of, of drivers to, uh, to enter the category. Yeah. I think the biggest uh, barrier today we see is that consumers are just not aware of the category and they don't understand how to cook with our products. Um, they, uh, and, 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 and the third barrier is basically what that's more a driver to leave the category is, is taste. So that they, there's a lot of consumers that leave the category because they're dissatisfied with the final proposition. Um, so these are the, um, the, the, the three key topics that we need to address to, to keep uh, consumers in the category or to, to recruit them. Yeah. The, the, uh, how to recruit new consumers for the Garden Gourmet brand is, is very much based on, on always delivering uh, on taste, so inspiring products, recipes, um, surprisingly good, um, that can be used uh, on all different kinds of UK occasions, not just once a week, but allowing you to to, to have a plant-based or a vegetable-based um, menu uh, the whole week long. Um, actually, in, in our brand essence, as Garden Gourmet, we uh, say we, cre we create the everyday Vegilicious Kitchen. I think one of, we have to be proud of how, how rich in taste and texture vegetables can be. And we have to inspire consumers with uh, all kinds of product propositions that, that we make and, and I think that is probably the biggest uh, um, driver for, for an increase in, in penetration and obviously we'll, we'll build on the Garden Gourmet brand across Europe so we'll make sure that 
that consumers um, can can see the products in store and and are aware of the brand through all kinds of media. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll just be in, invited to to try our brand because, as, especially in our category, but also for our brand, trying is believing. Our products are really good. Uh, I think you just tried one, and, um, and and very often we see consumers delighted by the taste and the texture of the products, while not necessarily expecting. So once once you've tried, you're in. 2025 or 2030 is, is quite nearby. So I, I would say that um, it is likely, it's very likely that uh, in general there's a better balance between animal proteins and plant-based uh, proteins. So we're aiming actually to, to bring it back to a 50-50 uh, balance, which is something that we had in the 60s. Huh? Uh, uh, only um, uh, 10, 15 years after the, after the war, we, we were in this balance, um, but we, we stepped up and, and partially was driven by, by governments who promoted the meat uh, uh, consumption um, as a good uh, kind of uh, source of uh, you know, muscle builder and strength and, and health in general. Um, so we should, we should go back to this uh, situation where, where uh, meat was not necessarily the, the, the key component of, uh, of a meal. So I would be very happy if we can see this by 2030. Uh, what we most likely also will see is a lot more innovation. Uh, first of all, from our side, as, as the Garden Gourmet brand, uh, we are focusing a lot on innovation to inspire consumers, so to find different uh, textures, different tastes, uh, building even further on different uh, usage occasions, because today the majority of the category is very much focused on delivering on uh, main meal uh, uh, solutions and I think we will see by 2030 many more uh, propositions that uh, offer uh, products that are uh, allowed or that are uh, feasible for uh, in between consumption, uh, breakfast uh, and the like. So there will be many more occasions to, con to consume our products and therefore contribute to a much better balance between animal and, and, and uh, plant-based proteins. There will also be I guess uh, innovations in terms of ingredients. So today we know that soy is a, a great ingredient uh, in, in the sense that it performs very well uh, both in texture and in protein uh, content. Uh, but I guess that by then we will have uh, new insights and, and, and potentially new, new ingredients um, that also can deliver in both texture and taste and, and, and protein content. So, um, I guess the landscape will be a bit different. Um, I'm sure that there's a much higher penetration of vegetarian uh, products uh, among consumers. Uh, and I'm sure that there's a much broader portfolio to, uh, to cater to different kinds of uh, consumers. So I am uh, Denis Chero. I am the CEO of Improve. Improve is an R&D center located one hour north of Paris in France. And we are experts in protein meaning protein fractionation, purification, functionalization, and characterization. In IMPROVE, we have uh, facilities in the pilot hall where we can do dry and wet process. And we have labs where we can do a lot of characterization in terms of composition, functional properties, digestibility. So everything which is needed to characterize and predict in which type of matrix food you can apply a protein preparation. So today we, we are um, in this uh, protein processing summit uh, presenting a large diversity of uh, process. Uh, you have to realize that we can apply protein extraction from many, many different types of raw material. Uh, roots, seeds, leaves, algae, microorganisms, sometimes my, uh, insects can be also part of the game. So it's a very wide range of uh, raw material. And of course, depending the type of raw material, you can apply a very wide and even wider range of technologies. As I explained, we can do dry and wet process, but in each family of process, you have plenty of different technologies. So you have traditional technologies, but we are also in improve trying to investigate what are the disruptive technology, what can be new, what can be bringing additional value to the market, to the players, helping them to better extract, better purify, make cheaper product or more uh, functional, more digestible. So try to answer all the questions and all the demand coming from the final cons consumers. 
We're a technology development company that's developing novel protein or novel technology which makes the lowest cost protein and is therefore relevant to the trillion dollar protein market. I, th I think with the global demand for protein increasing by more than 10 million tons per annum, it's evident that there's a requirement for sustainable protein and livestock farming is increasingly seen as both unsustainable and undesirable. Uh, and 3F Bio's technology uses a novel integrated fermentation process to transform the cost and our U core USP aims to be lowest cost producer and to bring a protein which is advantage in both terms of taste and texture for more than 30 years, but with transformative economics. I think disruption's got a huge role for this industry from two lenses, one from a global lens and equally from a European lens. From a global lens, the pressures on our planet are well known and well publicised and therefore we have a great requirement for sustainability, sustainability in carbon emissions and for the developing markets, sustainability will come through economic transformation and that's where I think disruptors such as 3F Bio have a role to play. If we look at Europe, then it's a slightly different role and the role of making lower cost, high quality products for vegetarian and flexitarians is equally valid. But I think our passion and our fundamental DNA is about that global role in terms of the, the macro impact on carbon and sustainability. And for me, uh, events such as Protein Summit are an absolute key role within this. 3F Bio plays one role within the supply chain and we're making low cost, high quality protein. But we will, we will not impact consumers without collaboration with much bigger and wider partners. To really access this market, we need to work with the best chefs, the best development companies, and the best B2C companies. At this, and from the Protein Summit, I think the network of people here is phenomenal. Um, and we'll, we will work collaboratively with anybody here and uh, really enjoying the summit. So thank you very much. Well, I think a given in the food industry is we always have to meet consumer wants. But I think increasingly we see that society is suggesting that the food industry has to start addressing some of their needs. Public health care, environmental sustainability, and accessibility to food, which includes affordability, are really sort of within the public realm. And I think that the future of food and innovation is going to require us to be looking at not only meeting what consumers want to have, but what society needs. You know, a lot of the food industry and a lot of society is organized in silos and we tend to do that because of uh, what traditionally has made sense. But I think as we see a time of change, uh, it requires all of us to re-evaluate who we are partnered with and how we need to look at issues. And I think when food goes beyond its traditional focus of simply meeting consumer needs and starting to look at societal needs, it means that we need unusual alliances and partnerships that might include environmentalists, that might include people from the medical industry, and certainly people who are involved in consumer behavior, because we are talking about the kind of shifts that will be needed to feed nine billion people in a way that's sustainable, a way that's affordable, uh, and a way that uh, will ensure that there's profitability throughout the, uh, the food value chain. Well, I think it's a time of great change, and, and I think there are many questions we don't have answers to. So. What excites me is this journey of discovery of how we can address society needs and consumer needs and how we can innovate in a way that creates win-win-win situations. I'm seeing that on a global basis, and certainly in Europe, we are re-evaluating how we look at protein and how we look at protein solutions. I'm interested to see that we really do have a continuum of discussion around protein from animal and plant proteins to animal and plant milks. And it's no longer one versus the other. To me, it's a discussion of the continuum of how both plant and animal solutions will be part of the future of food. This is my second attendance at Bridge to Food, um, and I'm becoming even a bigger fan uh, with each visit, so I, I know it won't be my last. I think the real value is bringing together an ecosystem of people across the food system that are working on trying to drive sustainable protein. So everything from food technology to marketers to innovation. And I think really sharing the learning that's happening in different markets is a massive value. We see a really big transformation that needs to happen in protein across the next 15 or 20 years. And it's going to take that time to build. So we think that there's going to be a need for more plant protein and alternatives to uh, reduce the impacts of, of animal protein 
uh, to meet our climate change goals, to meet the sustainable development goals. And we see lots of drivers and change in that direction. Uh, we see increasing scrutiny around animal feed and what is fed to animals. And we see lots of interest around how do we make waste streams into how high value protein sources for both humans and animals. I think the UK is a really dynamic market at the moment. I think there is a really strong discussion around health and sustainability around, uh, around food, um, particularly an, an alliance of actors that are working on the issues. I think there is a very strong growth and innovation on the high street led by companies like uh, pret a -Mange, delivering really exciting options on the high street. There is a growing awareness among the chef community of the importance um, and starting to grow into discussion at government level in terms of nutritional guidelines. So the UK is certainly dynamic. I think there is lots we can learn from the US in terms of the innovation, in terms of the quality of products. We need to maintain and improve the quality of products. We need to have products that are really desirable, really tasty, really yummy. Um, I think we can learn from the investment in marketing and the investment in building the, the, those brands and desire and pull for those products. And I think we can learn a lot from our friends in the Netherlands in terms of bringing together private sector, government, innovators, big companies around a common agenda and really driving action towards sustainable protein. So it seems to me from the conversations over the last day, that one of the biggest challenges we have is really driving consumer demand for more sustainable plant-based options. I think we need the leadership from business and NGOs on this thing, and we need the backing and support of government. That becomes really clear that those are really critical levers. Where we are seeing, seeing action is around investors, investors starting to ask questions. We are definitely seeing lots of innovation and startups and alternatives and those attracting investment. So I think we still have that big challenge around consumer investment. I think the area is ripe for opportunity. It's very exciting space at the moment. Protein is very dynamic. We might not call it protein challenge when we talk to consumers, but there are many companies and many people with solutions and offers that are quite exciting in the market. And we can learn from what's happened in plant-based milk and we can apply that to some of the broader protein system learning. So I, th I think the challenge for us is, is cutting through the language. So if you sit in an event like this, there's a lot of technical side of language and it's actually, this is about food and this is about what we're going to eat in the future that looks after my health and looks after the planet. It's as simple as that. So I think navigating that way is really what a lot of the discussion has been over the last, last day. It's just about food. <laughs>